I know there are some people in here that are 12 years old. I started using drugs at the age of 12 years old. My name is Billy Schneider. Some of the present day things that are going on in my life with my health because of some of the choices that I made. That's what gave me the cancer. I have full blown AIDS. Ask me if it's fun. I couldn't come to my father and tell him, your best friend's a degenerate. He touched me while I was sleeping. I got some tough memories of this neighborhood. I shot heroin in and out of this area. Washington Heights, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, New Jersey. Got my first arrest, not too far from here, Nagel Avenue. I spent 10 years of my life in prison, I'll tell you that now, so I can help you to identify who's talking to you. Because I've been where you're at. So you're just not talking to Lottie Dottie or anybody. You're talking to a man who's been in prison for 10 years of his life, has started that track at the age of 12. You guys been watching Forrest Gump? You know, his mom lied to him. So Forrest, life is like a box of chocolates. You just never know what you're gonna get out of it. That's not the truth. There are only two pieces. Don't be misled by all the other little pieces. There's only two. There's the right piece and the wrong piece. And it's your choice. I understand this is supposed to be a religious class today, right? I'll tell you what religion meant to me. And I, I'll do that by way of showing you, for starters, my arms. And that's what I did religiously every day. I would wake up with a desire to do this drug called heroin. Ain't you guys bogged down with enough information? Huh? Listen, I'm not challenging information. I'm challenging your choices. This movie, you know why this movie is? So when I die, this story can continue to be told. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, um, Billy, I just want to know how you got the AIDS disease. Um, probably from uh, IV drug use, maybe from sex, you know. Dirty needle or a dirty gal. Well, lots of promiscuous sex, you know, changing partners. You go, you know, you, you, uh, <clears throat> you have any morals, you know, and you're driven by something that was exposed as early, I told you. I've never been able to see myself as a child. We weren't children. We were, we were hassles. We were pain in the neck sometimes. We were loved. There was a different kind of love, though. But I never heard anybody say, my child. If, if I went to hug my dad, my dad would probably wrap me in the head and call me a queer. And I think of that now. Man, if you can't hold your dad, someone that you're supposed to look up to as a model to you, there's a sadness. You, when, you, when you don't get it at home, you get it outside. I used to think it was so cool, man. Run around with whomever. Run around with them ever. Here's a frightening tip. Do you know that alcohol is responsible for the spread of AIDS more than any other drug? You didn't know that, right? What did you think? What drug do you think was more responsible for the spread of AIDS? Heroin. That's what you would think, right? Because you got to inject it. You would think heroin, right? That's where AIDS comes from, from heroin addicts, right? No, the spread of AIDS spreads more with the drug of alcohol than any other drug. Let me tell you why. You are apt to do something you ordinarily wouldn't do under the influence of alcohol than any other drug. Sometimes when you go and you drink, you're gonna wake up with a stranger in your bed. So I can paint another picture for you. I have a Harley Davidson motorcycle. In my wallet, I have a fresh $100 bill, credit card, 
in this pocket, I have some money. It's real nice out. I'm on my Harley Davidson, and I pull up into a nightclub, and I go inside, and I see somebody that moves me. But sometimes somebody don't even have to move you. By the time closing times comes, you have to begin to move, if that's what you're looking for. See, if you're looking for some quick fix sex and interpret it as love, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. I could pick up a female like that, just like that. And you know what? She's dead. And she's going to wake up and say, where you going, honey? I said, well, I got to go kill somebody else. She would have made some pretty bad choices. I hope your heart right now, this is what I, I really hope. I hope your heart is pumping. I hope your heart is pumping. I hope you're some young gal today and you hear the word AIDS. I hope your heart is pumping. Or you're some young guy. I hope your heart is pumping. Sex is not love. I owned a soft turbo convertible. And I said, well, I got a cool car. I'm going to buy the best tires I can buy. I want you to just be careful to understand this is just another painting, another quick picture. $1,500 for the best rubber I could buy for my car. And a week later, I got a blowout. We got the picture. And that's all I had to say about that. Um, I have one. Now, having AIDS, how has it affected your life? In 10 years, I tested HIV positive back in 1988. But prior to uh, testing HIV positive, I had accepted Christ. So I had a positive outlook on my life. I was able to see that the AIDS was just a consequence of my choice that I can continue to live with it, that you don't have to fold up and die with it. I tested HIV positive in 1988, and I tested my T cells twice, and I, I never did it again. I didn't want my disease to dictate my life to me. I didn't want to have to go every day to a register and say, wow, one died, because I don't want to focus on death. I'm a Christian. I'm alive in Christ. So I decided I'm not going to think about death. I started thinking about life. And we're going to do this by way of metaphor, a picture. These T helper cells are ninja warriors. You got them in your mind? They're dressed up, man, and they're like... <coughs> of your body. I had to bring him along, by the way. His name is some dumb guy. They are the ninja warriors, your body. Their job is 27, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no vacation. T helpers are in there fighting and combating any foreign matter that you take into your body. And I realized my T cells, how important they are. I have 70 T cells left. And that was as of last month. I don't know how many are living now. But they fight off infection. If I shake your hands, you know what you get? You get a handshake from me. I'm no threat to anyone here. But if you sneezed, or you went to the bathroom, you didn't wash your hands, and then you shook my hand, I'm at risk for catching something and only have 70 left. Any more questions? Yeah, do you have any suggestions on how to keep other kids off of drugs? 
suggestions. Well, you know, you're not going to find it on a milk container. You know, they suggest to just say no. I think it takes more than just a, a no. It takes a conscious effort to realize what does that mean just to say no. It means, for me, it has to mean, does that person understand what the consequence how old are you, man? 16. 16. Do you know people at 16 die? Man, listen, I want you all to hear this. I've had students come up to me, 16, 15. I prayed with a girl a month and a half ago, 13 years old, with full-blown AIDS. I was in a school three weeks ago. In that school, they have in the double digits teenagers with AIDS already. What happened? It was more than just saying no. They bent towards, but she looks good. She's clean. Yeah, till you find out that she has a closet just like you do. We all have closets. There's junk in the closet. And you cannot take that chance that you're not going to be affected by the garbage. If that helps your question, it takes more than just a no. It takes like, you know, what is it? what is the no worth that on March 11th, 1977, is this lonely, empty, confused man it was on top of the George Washington Bridge, 450 feet in the air. And my actual climb to the top of that bridge was to get somebody to hear me. I needed help, I wanted help, but I really couldn't get anybody to listen to me. There are people in this room right now that know people that are on bridges. Now they may not be as high as the George Washington Bridge, but they're on a bridge in their life and they want to jump off. A friend does not pull a friend down. That's not a friend. A friend builds up. A friend is there to help you when you're in need. It doesn't mean you need money, that's your friend. A friend won't sell you drugs. A friend is gonna be someone that'll counsel you if you're going through a struggle. See, and I, I misinterpreted what friends were. I thought friends were people that called me up when I didn't have any drugs and would talk me into go stealing something, go breaking into something, trying something. Today I tell, I, I tell uh, teenagers all over the country, drugs are not getting you high. Drugs will never get you high. You listen to this. You will never experience a high on drugs. What you will experience when the drug takes total effect on you is a low. You will become depressed. You will become suicidal. You'll become empty because you're empty already or else you wouldn't need to take something else in to try to make you feel good. Sarah, you have a question? Yeah, what was jail like? Man. Actually, uh, this may sound warped, but jail was my friend for a while. Jail was a place where I could get fed, get taken care of, rest my mind, hang out. There's, there's two types of jails. Let's call it prison. There's two types of prison. There's a physical prison where there are bars, and there's a spiritual prison. And people are walking around in that spiritual prison. But the physical prison was a blessing many times. I'd have a bed. I would see a doctor. I'd have a meal, get breakfast, lunch, dinner, watch TV, be able to write. I write poetry. I'm registered in the Library of Congress as Billy Words. Um, play chess. I like to use my mind. I create things. 
do calligraphy. So it'd give me a, it would give me a chance to just, whew, who wants to worry about your next shot of heroin? You know? Prison gives you just another worry. When are you going to get out? <laughs> but you see, when I came out of prison, I still made the wrong choices. Man, I was still making the wrong choices. I got out, 1969. Still bad choices, still thinking I was cool, still wanting to be tough. I got tattoos all over my body. Remember that song, There's Always Something There to Remind Me? Huh? Should I come out of retirement and sing it? Always something there to remind me. <laughs> nice legs. Keep your eyes off it. I'm done. Always something there to remind me. And I look at those tattoos and I said, man, that's when I didn't know me. That's when I wanted to be tough. That's when I had to mark myself so people could see me. This is all lack of identity. I have tattoos all over my body. I have scars called tracks. Those scars are from needle marks. To get a scar like that, you have to inject yourself like I did. 21 years of my life, I injected myself with some form of drug or another. There were many times I would buy drugs and not even know what it was in it. Someone would tell me it was heroin. Someone would tell me it was cocaine. And I would just aimlessly, foolishly take that drug and shoot it into my veins. In the past, there were many times I would look in the mirror when I was under the influence of heroin or, or, or craving for that drug, uh, a heroin addict. I would look in the mirror and hate myself. I was sharing with Kim, I took a razor blade one day and I and I looked in the mirror and I was getting ready to just cut my throat and I can recall myself saying, I hate you, man. I hate you. So prison was a, was a, was a pal sometimes. Any other questions? Yeah, um, you mentioned that you were gonna like, slit your throat over with a razor. What stopped you from doing that? <sighs> the desire to go out and get another drug stops you. It brings you to a point of despair, but yet it, 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 uh, it empowers you. You don't have to slit your throat. Every time you inject or every time you take a drug, what you're doing is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a razor blade in itself. That next shot of heroin could be, the, you could be your last. I believe two things. The desire and the zeal to want to go and do, to do heroin again. And I also believe now that I could see back God's hand protecting me, saying, no. No, the time is not right, but I will reveal to you someday what I really want you to do with your life and your body. And it's not to hurt yourself. I understand that I was a victim. I understand that I had someone that wanted me to feel cheap think cheap and act cheap. That someone had me with a razor blade. Right on my throat. I stood in a mirror. I was gonna cut my throat. <laughs> and I looked in that mirror and I could hear myself now. It's a different mirror. It's a different man in the mirror. But the man that used to be in the mirror said this, I hate you! On Valentine's Day, 1987, Jesus Christ knocked on my heart and asked me to become his Valentine. And I accepted him as my personal Lord and Savior. Now by accepting Christ as my Lord and Savior meant that there was a process that I had to go through and the, and, and the hardest process for a man to go through is the process of becoming humble, to see yourself the way you are. I had to, for the first time in my life, see me 
the way God sees me. I understand what he is. I don't hate me anymore. I love me. For lack of a better term, today I think I'm cool. I think it's so cool that I could tell people the truth and not have to live a lie. Michael, you had a question? Yeah, um, what would you say is your greatest goal right now? What, what do you want to do the most? Good question. My goal is your question is to share that truth with whoever God will put in my path. My prayer daily, Michael, is that God, if you will put someone in my path today, my path, make it my responsibility, give me the boldness and the wisdom and the discernment not to become judgmental. You can't go up to somebody homeless and say, yo, man, why don't you get a job, man, and straighten out your life. You can't go up to an alcoholic and say, yo, man, what is with you? What is going on with you? Jesus didn't say smell him. He said tell him. My goal is to share Christ. To whomever. 8 to 80. Blind, crippled, or crazy. No matter. I have a great sense of well-being because I have a purpose. I have a message. I have, I have a challenge to young people. I have a challenge to anyone about the choices you make. Hope you guys don't feel beat up. I didn't come here to beat anybody up. I come here to share with people what can happen. I had a doctor hold my hand and he said, man, if you don't do chemotherapy, you'll be dead in 15 days. And whether it's 20 or 21 days later, here I am, I'm standing right in front of you. It's the only thing I have to live for. It's the only thing I want to live for, to come to challenge young people. I had a young man, 17 years old, come to me. and He said, man, some of the things you've been talking about today, man, I got to talk to you, dude. That's what's going on. He says, I think I may have AIDS. I said, you're 17, man. What makes you think that you're into that risk? He said, because lots of the things you've been talking about I've been involved in. I stuck needles in my arm. So he asked me if I'd go to the health center with him. I couldn't do it unless I got permission from the school and they in return had to get permission from the parents. They called the mother up. She said, let him go. Who would be better to go with him than this man? And we went. And I watched this guy pull up his sleeve. And I watched him take the blood and I said, the poor guy. He thinks it's over. It ain't over. The moment they drew that blood, this is what happened. He couldn't hear it yet. He didn't see it. But use me, I'll tell you what happens. And I looked at Scott and he had his head between his legs and I says, tell me man, what are you gonna do if you test HIV positive? He says, I think I'll be able to deal with it, man. He said, but Billy, that's not what's bothering me. I said, what's up? Please share it with me. He goes, man, you don't understand. I slept with at least 10 girls in that school in the last two years. You guys got a choice. I'm pleading with you, please. If there's something going on in your life that's not right, turn away from it before it catches up to you and crawls around your neck like a snake and chokes you to death. Please, be careful. If you can't be anything else, be careful. Be on the alert. The time is now for you guys to make the right choices.